all right guys we are back in my garage for another video and it is finally time to go stage two i know when we were stage one you guys were already scared but now we're literally going to be peeling the pavement off of the earth so we're going to go ahead and tune this x7 see how things change and do a little bit of a review of how the tune performs so hopefully you guys find this video useful Now, as always, for everybody that's new to the channel, I create these videos to help keep you updated on the latest developments in our community, as well as discuss technical topics so that we have a better understanding of how our engines work. So if you're interested in more videos like that, be sure to subscribe because there will be a lot more coming out in the future. Now we're getting ready to flash my car, but really quick shameless plug, I will have a link to buy your MHD tuning license in the video description. This is software for your N55, S55, B58, S58, a bunch of different cars, and it is the easiest way to flash directly from your phone to unlock power on your BMW. In this video, of course, I have a downpipe, so we're going to be going stage two, but in my previous video, I showed that even just the stage one tune on a completely stock car unlocks a lot of performance. So I highly recommend it. Use that link in the video description if you want to buy an MHD tune and that is an affiliate link so it does help support the channel. So the first thing you're going to do of course is connect to your ENET adapter. I highly recommend the MHD universal adapter that will work for MHD, XHP, Bimmer code, Bimmer link, basically any software you want to use on your phone to diagnose, tune, change settings, whatever you wish. So I will also have that linked in the video description, but that's what I'm using. So I'm going to go ahead and connect to that Wi-Fi adapter. And then we're going to go into the MHD app and select flash and MHD map. It's going to contact and connect to the DME. And then once it's connected, you will see all of the maps that you have available. So you can see stage zero is like a stock tune. Stage one and stage two are the static flashes, but we're going to flash MHD multi-map. So I go ahead and select stage two. I'm going to select which fuels I want for each map slot. So I'm doing 91, 93, E40, and full E85. Yes, you can run full E85 with this tune. And then we're going to go ahead and select the MHD plus multi-map. Again, it'll connect to the DME. And then you have a couple different options you can change. So scroll through here and change anything you want. I talked about this a little more in my stage one video, but generally you want to make sure you put that you have your catless downpipe on here. So for the exhaust setup, click on that and select that you have a catless downpipe and then make sure everything else matches what you want. So I have burbles disabled, you know, everything else for me is pretty much stuck. I always turn on sport cooling for the intercooler. So I highly recommend that for anybody, but you can also see for each map, you can change what you want your exhaust to do. So change your burble settings, change, you know, startup wrap, things like that. So then we're going to go ahead and hit map right. Since I've already flashed stage one, it doesn't have to do the unlock process. So this should go pretty quickly. Go, go ahead and click on that. It'll communicate to the DME. You'll start hearing the dings and the gongs inside of the car. You know, it'll show a drivetrain malfunction, chassis stabilization error. All of that stuff is normal. After it goes through the process, it will clear all of the codes, so none of that will stick around. So you can see after flashing the car, it will restart the DME, code the DME, then it's gonna go ahead and clear all of the codes. So you'll start seeing all of the lights and everything go away. And then once that's done, you just have to wait. So if the car doesn't turn off on its own, turn it off. I like to open the door as well, just to make sure it completely shuts down. Give it 30 seconds for everything to reset and then you can start the car and drive. All right, so now it's time to get some data. So what we're going to do is get some draggy times, run some data logs. You guys already know the drill. We wanna know exactly how the car is performing, if everything's safe, if it's even quicker than stage one, you know, all of that good stuff. So in here, we're gonna put the transmission into sport, put the car engine, into sport mode all right settle down bessie we're not running out yet and we'll see how this thing does so let's head over to kern raceway and get some numbers all right we're gonna start a little slow we'll see which times we get i don't know if we'll get up to 130 let's go Ha <laughs> 
Can't quite get there. These cars, man, with the stock turbo, it just runs out of steam up top, especially with all the extra weight in the car. You know, down low, you definitely feel the torque, but up top, it just doesn't want to keep carrying speeds. But that's okay. We'll go ahead, head back to the lab, check some logs, check our draggy data, and see where we ended up. All right, guys, so we're back, and now it's time to go through the data. The first thing we're going to look at are the draggy numbers. So as we saw, unfortunately, the X7 still doesn't 60 to 130. So we're going back to the custom modes that we created in draggy so that we can compare the times to our stock and stage one numbers. So we started off at 50 miles an hour and ended at three different speeds, 100, 110, and 120 miles an hour. Now, unfortunately, this was pretty disappointing because my stage two times weren't any faster. When I looked at my stage one numbers from 50 to 100, my best time was an 8.21, and on stage two, it was an 8.2. So a 0.1% improvement in my performance, definitely underwhelming. Then on the 50 to 110, my best time was 11.01, .01, and it went down to a 10.92, so almost a full tenth of a second faster. And then the 50 to 120 went from a 14.11 to a 13.95. So all of that I was really disappointed with and I felt like something was wrong. But of course, temperatures weren't on my side when I went stage one. That was back in January. Now it's the middle of the summer. Temperatures are getting over 90 degrees. And so I decided to reflash with the active shutters open. And you can actually lock them open in MHD and that will make sure that you get as much airflow as possible over your heat exchanger and it should help improve IETs and things like that. And sure enough, that was the ticket. After opening them up and rerunning the car, still similar temperatures, I was able to drop my 50 to 100 time to a 7.79. So now it's about 5% faster than the stage one tune. My 50 to 110 was a 10.21. And then my 50 to 120 dropped to a 13.02. So that was a much bigger difference if we're doing kind of a correlation with the horsepower rating. The car started at 335 horsepower. Going up to stage one, based on the percent improvement, it was around 405 to 409 horsepower. And then going up to stage two, it bumped us up to around 422 to 424 horsepower. So much more noticeable, much more significant, and you can finally see it in the performance numbers. I also thought it was interesting to see that as we increased the end speed going from 100 to 120 to 120, the difference got bigger. So I think the tune paired with the downpipe not only is making the car faster, but it is improving the top end and the car is accelerating better in higher speeds. So as the car gets faster, you see a bigger difference in the performance time. So a definite win-win, you know, it felt more torquey in the car, it carried more speed up top. Still not quite enough space on current raceway to actually hit 130, but maybe we'll get there in the future. Now, performance is great, but we wanna make sure the tune is safe. So let's go ahead and look at the data logs and see how this stacks up. So now we're in data zap looking at our logs and starting off with stage one, just for comparison purposes, let's see where the car was at and boost of course is a big point a lot of us are focusing on and it peaked around 16.5 PSI in the mid range, averaging around 15 to 16 across the rev range. So pretty good, you know, but once we bumped things up to stage two, you can see now boost is over 19 PSI, sometimes even over 20 PSI. I think we might just barely, uh, here we hit around 21 PSI, a little above 5,000 RPM, and then it tapers off in the mid to high 20s. So pretty good, uh, much better than where stage one was. We're seeing like four to five PSI over the stage one boost, and that is where most of the performance gains come from. Again, just adding a downpipe can give you minimal performance improvements. It'll help the turbo spool a little more quickly and things like that. But these kind of gains only come from a tune. 
And the advantage here is that without the restrictive catalytic converter in the downpipe, you're able to safely run more boost and the turbo can work more efficiently. So that's what kind of works its way into the change in performance here. So this is kind of what MHD has determined is safe for the turbo. Yes, you can run stage two on a stock downpipe technically, but it's highly recommended to use an aftermarket downpipe at a minimum, catless downpipe preferred, just to make sure that it can handle the extra boost and you're not gonna see excess back pressure and things like that. Now the challenge was when I was running this setup, you can see that ambient temperatures were pretty high. They were around 77 degrees. Whereas when I ran my stage one tune, if you look at the ambient temperature, it was around 35 degrees. So over 40 degrees of temperature difference between January and June, which shouldn't really be a surprise, but that's kind of what we're experiencing here. So I decided to test and keep the active shutters open so that I would optimize my IATs because what you see on these stage two logs is what I would call not ideal. So we started around 113 degrees Fahrenheit and it got up to over 130 at the top end. So very, very high, not enough to put the car into limp mode or anything, but much higher than you would want for optimal performance. So I reran my stage two logs and this time I kept the shutters open. You can see that boost was a little bit lower, which should not be a surprise because temperatures were lower and a lot of the things that our car targets are based on load and torque calculations. If it needs more boost to hit the same amount of pressure and hit the same amount of performance that it's looking for, it will do that in hotter temperatures to compensate. But once the temperatures come down, it'll usually run less boost to safely make the same amount of power. So that's why here we're only seeing it peak just over 20 PSI in the mid range. However, if we look at our IATs, whereas before it was getting up to over 130, now at the top end, we can see, you know, revving out this gear, it was around 115 and it started off around 100. So literally a 15 degree Fahrenheit reduction in temperatures just from keeping the shutters open. I would say that's very significant. As you can see from the performance numbers, it definitely netted a much better improvement but I ended up reverting it back to letting the OEM functionality for the shutters take over. A big portion of that is I do a lot of road trips, I do a lot of daily driving, and it is still a very big, heavy car. So if that can help me get a little more efficiency with the engine warming up quicker, getting better gas mileage and things like that, I'm fine with that. But if I were to go to a race and I wanted the absolute best performance possible, I would definitely lock those shutters open so I could get the maximum amount of cooling. So. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's look at everything else. So boost is looking good. Next, we wanna look at fueling. In this log, I was only running pump gas and most people just assume that's safe, but some people will tell you, even on pump gas, you can overwhelm your fuel system. If it requests too much boost for what your fuel system can support, you'll see dips in fuel pressure, you'll see lean lambda readings. So it's still something that you wanna pay attention to. So first thing we'll look at is rail pressure and Throughout the pool, we'll single that out. We can see that rail pressure is exactly where we want it to be, around 5,000 PSI. No big dips or anything. It's kind of hovering around the 350 bar target range. So all of that is good. Then we can go ahead and look at Lambda up here and we can see our AFRs are kind of what we expect as we come into boost, it begins to drop and it stays around 12.4 to 12.5 Lambda. Now, some people think that this is lean, but if you're coming from a port injected car, just know that direct injection cars naturally run leaner and there is a leaner target AFR for the optimal performance while keeping everything safe. So usually it's around 0.84 to 0.85 Lambda, and that should translate to these AFR calculations here. So all of that is looking good as well. Now, the last thing we wanna look at is timing. So we'll look across and we already see some jerkiness. This is usually where stuff for me struggles because my fuel quality isn't the best. So you can see some variation in the mid range as timing corrections are made. That's what those big drops are along the timing curve. But the good thing is as we get towards red line, things start to even out. You can see basically all of the timing is getting upwards of 11.5 to 12 AFR. And even cylinder one, the problem child that always seems to struggle, we can see is holding 10.8 up towards red line. So 
I'm happy with this. I would say it's safe. Of course, it's not ideal. It would be perfect if all of the timing were exactly where it should be, but this will vary from time to time, and this was a really high-stress scenario since it was so hot outside. As things get cooler, timing will be better, and all of that will help improve the performance and consistency of the car. So I would say this is definitely safe. If you see more than like three degrees of timing correction, really consistency and a lot of variation across the cylinders, then you might consider either adding some ethanol. So you can put one or two gallons of E85 in your tank to see if that helps. Usually that'll clean it up. Or you can bump down to 91 octane. So in this case, it's 93 or 98 RON. So you can bump down to 91 octane or 95 RON. Yes, it will be slower, but the logs will be cleaner and it'll be safer if you have poor fuel quality. So yeah, I think we're gonna go ahead and stick with this. I'm happy this looks good because I really didn't want to go back. And uh, I don't know, we'll see, maybe there's more in the future. But yeah, overall, I would say this log definitely looks safe, good, kind of ideal for an off the shelf map. You could always go for a custom tune as well, but I think I'm pretty happy with how this came out. So yeah, overall, very happy with the tune. I highly suggest it to anybody that's looking at getting a little bit more performance and noise out of their car without making it, you know, really obnoxious and things like that. I think the downpipe is pretty tame. The performance is optimal for a regular stock turbo setup and you're not really breaking the bank to get there. So again, I will have a link to the MHD license, the downpipe that I'm using and the universal adapter in the video description in case you guys are interested in replicating my setup. Otherwise, I think that's it for this video. So thank you guys for watching and I hope this helps. And if you have any other questions or comments, leave them down below.